recording going? Thanks everybody so much for coming out. This is one of our first live uh, Zoom events for the trail. Uh, and we are really excited um, to have two of the most dedicated, some of the smartest people that I know, Mel Price and Peter Johnson of Work Program Architects here with us. Um, WPA, uh, along with your creative team at Grow, um, shout out to, to Janice Pang, who's an amazing designer there, have really been working for the last two years uh, on um, a massive, um, complete wayfinding signage package for the trail. So uh, this signage package covers the entire 10 and a half mile trail and the Sentara Loop. Uh, and it will quadruple the current signs uh, that we have out there. So um, I just want to thank Mel and Peter again for sharing uh, your time and all of your expertise with us today. Um, and maybe just get us started and let us know how, and everybody else here, how you first got involved with the ERT. Okay. Um, well, shout out to other ERT folks on the call. Liz. Uh, Shastley is here from Timmons Group, and she's our um, partner on master planning, and Timmons is also doing a, a ton for the trail, and she participated in a lot of the walks with Cheryl and Peter and I, and then Chris Nykirk um, uh, with Smart Mouth and on the ERT board, and um, there's all sorts of cross collaboration of all of our small companies, so um, thanks. Um, well, we got involved with the ERT um, a couple of years ago when the Greater Norfolk Corporation asked what was the single most important project that, that their group could take on and brainstorm on that would help attract and retain talent in the city. And there was a group of us that got together and we made a list of projects and we, we had some big projects from some small projects and in the end, it was unanimous that everyone felt like this beautiful trail that um, just snakes its way through uh, the city for 10 and a half miles is the amazing asset that no one has ever, that we've all taken for granted and we haven't kind of worked to um, promote within the city. And so we all jumped on board and, and started the foundation and then broke ourselves up into different committees. So. Peter and Liz and Cheryl and I all work on the master planning committee. So we are dedicated to planning the future of the trail, trying to solve current problems. And it's really important that we hear from anyone who loves the trail and uses it or uses it and doesn't love it or, you know, that we hear feedback about the particular points that you walk because everyone walks a different section or bikes it and you start to notice details. And what we need to hear from people is all the little details that we need to work on improving. Well said. Peter has, <laughs> he uses less words than I use. So, but here we go. Um, does anyone else wanna speak up and just tell us if you're a trail users? Um, just so we know if you've been on the trail, if you haven't been on the trail, anyone wanna hop in? Greg, I nominate Greg. You're muted, Greg. But you're muted. Unmute. There we go. Nope. There we go. I think you're I there. There we go. There we go. <laughs> there we go. I think I Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm a trail biker. Um, do it almost every day, except when it's really raining a lot. And uh, so I see a lot of you out there, I think. And uh, I've got a few comments that I put down, and uh, I think a lot of them tend to relate to marking on the trail and that kind of thing. And I know that you've done a lot with that, and you've probably covered most of those things. The only other two comments that I wanted to put on here actually had to do with um, potentially some additional signing. It's probably beyond what you've, you've done up to this point in terms of wayfinding, but it might address some of the COVID issues that are going around now. And I guess I'm kind of concerned, especially with joggers and bikers, about the spacing on the trail. And uh, not just the lateral spacing side to side when you're passing someone or someone's passing you or you're out on the trail with someone else, uh, but also this, the separation distance between bikes on the trail. And um, I, I've noticed in riding over the last 
month or two thereabouts, that um, people are tend to bunch up a lot on the trail and bikers tend to, you're out with friends and you tend to get pretty close. And um, the six foot separation really doesn't apply to bicycles. You need something that's significantly longer. There have been several studies that have come out about that. There have been some computational models and also some wind tunnel data that are really suggested that you need maybe two or three times that spacing mm -hmm. if you're in line and the wind isn't blowing sideways. So there are some other factors involved. Yeah. But I think that more people need to be aware of that and I'm not sure the best way to do it. And of course, the other thing is when you're passing someone, um, you also, you need to take that into consideration as well. I think wearing a mask probably helps a lot, but a lot of people don't or don't want to. And bikers and joggers in particular, when you're really panning and huffing and pushing hard, you're probably spraying a lot of things out. So it's, it's just something that I think we need to pay attention to. I don't know exactly how you deal with that in terms of the trail marking. Uh, and it's not directly associated with wayfinding, but I just wanted to bring it up so the issue was kind of out there and people can think about it, so. But we do like the sign that you guys put out because you do say the, the six feet. Yeah. I mean, I've seen those signs, which I think is great, but he's just saying it should be more than that for bikes, probably. Yeah. Right. We've seen some good graphics come out over the past week or so, really telling people, you know, when they're going certain speeds, roughly, they need to maintain these types of distances mm -hmm. front to back, especially in their slipstream where all those virus laden yeah. particles are floating around behind them. Yeah. And we're going to be sharing some, some details, some safety tips for cyclists um, next week. We've got it as part of our messaging around bike month. So we're definitely going to incorporate some of those tips, you know, wearing a mask and, and, and you know, riding, doing separate distances, as well as all the basics, the wash your hands, all of those things that still apply um, yeah. too. So yeah, hopefully we'll get the message out a little bit more. Okay, more specifically, just a couple points on the wayfinding. Uh, real quickly, the terminus at uh, Norfolk State still isn't very well marked, and I know that I've talked with Cheryl about this and a few others. I have had questions from other people who are riding the trail and are you know, not as familiar with it. And you kind of see them out there, and they spin around a little bit, you know, when they get to uh, the Brambleton point, and they kind of wonder, well, do we go on? Or there's, there's no real indication there of what's happening. And so it would be good if... You know, that were, that were a little better marked. And, um, and the one other thing, I guess, along the way too, a lot of people ask, you know, should we really have a center line on the trail? And I don't know if that's ever been a part of a discussion at any point or not. And yeah. I know a number of other bike trails and utility trail or, you know, pedestrian runner trails that I've been on in the DC area, for example, frequently have center line markings. And I know now with families getting out and that kind of thing, you'll encounter someone heading in your direction or whatever, where they're all over the trail. And nobody really has a sense of, well, you should kind of let people pass and you know move. Center lines tend to help that a little bit, but maybe that's something you really don't want to do with ERT, I, I don't know. No, we'll, we'll tell you, I'll, I'll get into, I'll start through the broad um, presentation, but then let's talk about some of those details because we've had a ton of conversation about them and we've come to our own conclusions, but we may want to, we have, you know, we have time to rethink some of that as well. So, um, okay. well, I'll share my screen and let's see. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll share my screen. Does anybody else want to hop in with just some big picture thoughts before we start? Runners, bikers, walkers? Townsend? Is it? Nancy, you ride it a lot. Yeah. I'm Keith Brown and I do a lot of um, cycling, biking on the trail. And I'm, I've done the cap to cap number of times too. And if you ever ride other trails, when you come up to an intersection, there's always a mark. And it worries me a lot of times on the Lizard River Trail that when you come to an intersection, it's not always a mark or you got to look at different places to the sign. Signs should be for bikers, should be at a certain height level and at the same place. And you should be looking a lot most of the time on the ground. One of my biggest concerns is um, safety at intersections and there should be a stop sign or some kind of sign on the ground or at least at the same height because I'm worried about little kids trying to go you know through intersections especially around power around the ODU loop around power tan um, as a matter of fact then across the light rail track 
unfortunately, a friend of mine got hit and had earplugs, earphones, iPods in his ears by the light rail. But we need to um, make some the intersections a little bit better marked of where you need to stop, dismount, check both ways, because I think that is a real issue for us. Good, good ideas. Um, but it's great. As far as showing off Norfolk, I've taken a lot of friends on it. A lot of people that live here don't even know the route and are trying to figure out where it's supposed to go, especially the loop around the hospital, which is a great loop um, to go around the Hague and up by the museum and see the museum. It's beautiful. And um, so we have a lot to showcase Norfolk. And there are areas on the trail, too, that are narrow. And we need to, it'd be great if, especially when we start developing the trail more, if we could get a, a certain width, because that center line is, I think, really necessary where it's real narrow. So you know which side to go on. But it, it's nice not to have a center line, but if you have enough width, you probably don't need the center line on, for biking. And that's just a few okay. thoughts. Okay. Well, anybody else want to share thoughts? Yeah, let me just throw out there. My biggest pet peeve is uh, warn before passing. Nobody ever warns before passing. I don't know how many cyclists I've almost hit because I didn't know they were coming up behind. Uh -huh. that's, that's just one of my big pet peeves. I, Nancy, I will confess that before we did this, I had not been on a bike since I was 15, since before I could drive. And I'm, I'm still shy about saying that. Some part of my politeness feels rude shouting out to people. I'm uncomfortable. It, it, it's something that definitely makes me uncomfortable to say, hey, I'm passing or I'm on your left because to me it feels rude and that sounds really crazy to say that out loud. But I need to, I need to see more people doing it to get comfortable because I think I'm starting from the standpoint of a not particularly confident biker. Uh, I don't want to shout at people. I want, I've got my bell. I feel better ringing my bell, but I think it's just not part of our culture here yet, except for folks who bike all the time. And the more we do it, the more it's going to feel normal to do that and the safer it will be. So I need some help with that. Ringing the bell is fine. Just let somebody know you're passing. Um, yeah. And again, if you're shy about it, you're not going to be shy if you get run over. True. Instead, I do like, I just slow down really slowly. I'm like, hello, I'm passing you. But that's not normal either. So, yeah. People who run, who do a fan type we could introduce just to sort of let people know mm -hmm. what, our, what our plan is for the trail and what to expect. It, maybe that, maybe what you just said, maybe we need a sign say, saying ring your bell or it's okay to, it's okay to shout passing on the, or something like that. Yeah, they have that on the WNOD trail, warn before passing. That's, mm -hmm. Okay. That's the signs and that's always one of them. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I think Mel's going to share her screen and show some images. And if you guys have any questions while she's presenting, you can ask or you can use the chat feature and we'll make sure we hit those questions afterwards. All right. Okay. Um, we are, up, we are working off of a very wide screen. Does this look normal to you guys? Is it okay? No, it doesn't look normal. It's got the full view. If you want to go into present mode. Okay, let me go back. Hold on. Um, view. Oh, I was in. I was in present mode. Is it not showing? It's you just know? showing your full screen, but we're still getting all the, the images oh, are quite okay. large. So, can I do that. Mm -hmm. View full screen. Sorry. Better. A little better. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, guys. Huh? Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so Peter and I are with WPA. Um, we are, I'm an architect. I'm an industrial designer <laughs> and urban designer. Um, but we've done a couple of signage projects and so we've just kind of figured it out. Um, we are not signage experts, um, but we've just walked it and walked it and walked it and we do our best to kind of um, pick this apart from a user perspective. So 
you all know the trail. Um, it reaches from the, the end of the port at the terminal and weaves its way through Largemont and Edgewater and ODU's campus and Lambert's Point and Chelsea and all of our breweries around to Fort Norfolk and have a loop around the medical complex and straight along the water in downtown uh, behind Harbor Park and right to the gateway of Norfolk State. And the cool thing is that within a five minute walk, there are 28 unique different neighborhoods with a five minute walk to the trail. So we're connecting um, all, you know, people from all over the city and um, we have all different types of users. Um, we've been successful in fundraising because we've been able to connect our employment um, uh, areas and economic generators and we've built a love for the trail and we've built um, support of private companies to contribute money to help this public amenity so we're lucky to have it where it is. I think you all know the trail well. Um, one of the things we love about it is that it's like you're going through 30 different terrains you know we're, we're having this talk about should you put a stripe down it should you not and what we did when we kind of broke the trail down for master planning is we said well the trail kind of naturally dictates a little bit what's going to happen um you know it runs through a historic neighborhood it runs through a festival park it's on wood planks so we're going to have to as designers adapt to all of these different conditions of the trail there's probably not a one size fits all rule for any part of how we do this which has made it more complex but it also makes it really fun and interesting and unique. And as much as I love the Cap Trail, there's parts of many of those trails that are, um, that are monotonous and it's long and it's straight and it's really best for a cyclist who's just going. And our trail is, is a little bit more how you kind of slowly show off your city to your friends and family and it meanders and it's, it's got so many things to look at. And because we're on the water, the background always changes as ships come in and go out. So it's been a tough design task um, and that's why we need so much feedback. Um, so our mission as a foundation, as a board, is to create the most iconic urban riverfront trail in the country. And that means embracing all of the different parts of this that make us different from other places. Um, jump in. This was uh, one of the first maps we did actually several years ago when we were starting to work on the trail. Uh, really trying to figure out where it is right now and uh, where we want it to go in the future. Uh, so one of the kind of start up in north and talk about some of these things that we're planning and these really were in the back of our mind as we were doing this whole signage process trying to set things up for this you know expansion. Um, we definitely want to get it all the way up to Naval Station Norfolk up Hampton Boulevard. Um, we've been looking at that and kind of had periodic talks with the Navy so it's definitely something in our minds um, and a very big goal of the trail. So we can really see that being great for commuters to the base. Um, an extension out to the point of the international terminals uh, is a really beautiful space. There's a design firm actually working on that right now. Uh, it's a really interesting project, but it'll probably give you one of the coolest views in the entire city, be able to go out there and look across the Lafayette. Um, around ODU, we're really starting to do these loops around all of our anchor institutions, educational places. Uh, so ODU, Sentara, EBMS, CHKD, and NSU. And we're going to each of those three getting a loop around it uh, to really make it as usable as possible for the people that you know, live and work in those places or are visiting them. Uh, and then a little bit of rerouting around ODU. One of our core principles of the trail has been to keep the trail as close to the water as possible. So you can see these red areas are where we're thinking about shifting the trail. Almost all of them are things that we're doing uh, very deliberately to try and get the trail closer to the Elizabeth River. And then down towards the south, you'll see we've looked at a potential loop even over through Campus Stella, looking at crossing the Berkeley Bridge and then coming back on the Campus Stella Bridge. Uh, there's a lot of beautiful neighborhoods over there. Really great way to reach out and get to you know broader part of our community and uh, really engage with the river a lot better. And then uh, getting around NSU through Chesterfield, and then possibly one of the most exciting is getting across uh, Broad Creek so we can tie up with the uh, light rail alignment and get all the way out to Virginia Beach. And we have been coordinating with the folks in Virginia Beach to try and get 
uh, tie in with the extension of their planning. So hopefully you'll be able to ride from Naval Station Norfolk out, out to the Virginia Beach Ocean Front on one continuous trail. Um, as part of this effort to make sure we build a system of signage that's set up for future expansion, um, we needed to think about really our starting point and, and that's really right here, which is uh, at the, this is on the Spooner, Virginia, back behind Nauticus, um, where we have the mile marker out in the water for um, mile marker zero for the Intracoast Waterway. And we thought if we set our mile marker zero, and I'll go back to the map, um, at the mile marker zero for Intracoast Waterway, then we can sign this thing as the north and then east so that we have a zero and we can always keep going this way and we can always keep going this way. And should we need to go other directions, we can do that from the zero point as well. Um, so we started by just going to all of our civic leagues and going to really any community group that would have us and have us talk about the trail. And there were often times where we go in a room full of 50 people and we were, you know, literally 30 steps from the trail and nobody knew about it. So, um, so much of this activity and all the folks who participate on the board has been bringing awareness to the trail. Um, Cheryl runs, uh, does rides every Saturday. She's brought folks who really haven't been downtown, but live within a mile of downtown to the waterfront. So we're really trying to pull people from all over to do enjoyable activities on the trail. Um, so on the left is the map that you'll see on our rack cards, and it corresponds with the trail as it's broken down on the ERT website. And you'll see what's described as sections and then trailheads. And early on, what we talk about breaking this up into natural topography, we wanted to kind of break down these sections into manageable parts that related to the neighborhoods that they passed through and made sense from the standpoint of it feels like I'm leaving one terrain and moving on to the next one. So that's how we broke down the sections of the trail. Um, we also knew that long term, this is going to be amazingly popular. People are going to want to drive here and explore the trail from other areas. So we knew that having a place um, with public parking that was free where people could drive in get out of their car, plop down, have a picnic, fill up a water bottle, let the dog out, et cetera, was really important. So we, we worked with businesses and the city and these areas along the trail to designate um, trailheads where all of those amenities would be available. So it's like a super concentration of amenities um, and every trailhead will have a bike rack and a bike maintenance station and a trailhead structure with solar panels to charge the lights that light this up at night and a trailhead map so you get oriented. So that was kind of the big picture planning that laid the foundation for the work that we're doing. Um, moving on, um, we did this kind of high level planning for each trailhead and we recognize that every, every trailhead, every section is unique. So we tried to think about what would be a meaningful or important thing to have at that particular location. And so we have these, and I think, Cheryl, we're going to start to try and get this stuff up on the website so that all this planning is really out available to the public and we can get more feedback. Um, so we'll get, we'll get that up. Um, this talks about kayak launches, and I think this is important to point out because as much as we plan to expand, we also hope to in the future keep adding kayak launches like we have at Plum Point Park and create a parallel blue trail system so that, you know, you can put your kayak in at Plum Point, kayak over here, put it in your kayak storage, lock it up, and then walk downtown, grab a bite to eat, and kayak back. So we have all sorts of layers to the planning for this. Um, and this really shows you uh, our mile marker zero for the trail on the pier behind Nauticus and Half Moon. Um, this is a public art mural, the magenta line. Speak up, I'm talking too uh, much. <laughs> so when we were laying out the uh, mile marker zero as the zero point of the trail, we started doing some research into the uh, intracoastal waterway. And 
found some nautical charts and uh, talk among uh, Coast Guard officials who were talking about their mapping of the, uh, the various waterways. And you know, none of us are boaters, but we found out that uh, the Intracoastal Waterway was referred to as the magenta line because it was drawn as a magenta line on the nautical charts. Uh, so that really kind of gave us the idea for what to do with this mural that can be seen from rather high up in the air, but it's also really fun to kind of walk as you go down the pier that's back behind Nauticus. So this was a donation boat based yoga class uh, overlooking uh, the, the pier in our mile marker zero with, I believe, a Viking ship pulled next up next to it. So just kind of a snapshot that talks about the uniqueness of the trail. Okay, here are the signs. We're going to break down the sign family. So we have hundreds of these signs in our possession. We're getting ready to sign a contract with the installer and we just want to tell you about them and how they'll be used and how we set out designing them. So uh, just sort of big picture we did uh, a lot of full-scale mock-ups with our committee. We laid out all sorts of versions of these signs, everything from kind of black and white, inverting the black and white, doing the full color, two color. Uh, we did a lot of testing on readability and scale. Uh, you've probably seen some of the, the test signs we put out. Uh, they were stickers we put up over the uh, existing signs to test the visibility and kind of check to see how these looked in different environments. Uh, so it was a big committee effort to come up with uh, this design and this family that hopefully is very readable and identifiable. And we tried to make sure there are similar elements and colors so you don't have to really search for the signs. They kind of pop out to you once you realize what it is you're looking for. So we'll walk you through, um, I think there's, an, let me just peek yeah. ahead. Yeah, That's there's right. some other, so it, we'll break it down further. Payment markings, you asked about that. So we've got uh, kind of two different types. Uh, one of the first things I got really excited about with signage was a blaze. I uh, used to really love hiking and camping on the Appalachian Trail, and that just white blaze is an icon of its own. Uh, so that was one of the first things we wanted to work on and develop something as iconic for the Elizabeth River Trail. Uh, so that's what you see on the left. Uh, we've sized it to, uh, to be proportional to bricks. So we do have a lot of brick pavers. Uh, so there are some that are larger and some that are kind of brick sized. Uh, but those will be kind of scattered through various areas where we have a hard time either getting signage up where people can see it or we don't want to put too much sign clutter out um, and kind of overwhelm a contextually sensitive neighborhood. Think about Freemason and behind the pagoda. They, they didn't want a whole lot of new stuff there, so we have to be sensitive. But if we put something striking, you can still see it really easily. And then we've been working with the city and their transit department to develop this uh, show specific to the ERT, which was a really interesting process. So we've been able to dovetail with their own Shero programs that they were putting on, putting in uh, Shero markings on various streets, add an ERT symbol to it, and they've allowed us to actually adjust the angle of the arrow uh, so we can use these as on pavement directional signage. Kind of tell you to start to go, you know, to the side a little bit. So it works for both letting drivers know that there's going to be ERT users on the road and also tell the ERT users where they should be going. Uh, so you can see some of these over in Larchmont, um, kind of through that neighborhood. And then there's some, I believe, over in Fort Norfolk and a few others going in in various other locations. So these are kind of the bulk of the signs. The smaller ones you see on the left, the 7 by 12, they're very similar to the size of the signs that are out now. We didn't want to come back with something significantly larger that would kind of clutter the space. Um, we're hoping they're a bit more visible and uh, more readily red <laughs> <laughs> as you're biking and walking through. Uh, we are maintaining a consistent height to them uh, with the new installation and kind of depending on the, the size of the sign, they'll be uh, between uh, 64 inches up to uh, I believe about seven feet for the very large ones. Um, so, they're, okay. Oh, they're uh, actually vitreous enamel signs. So it's a steel plate and then these graphics, the, the blue part and then the logo are applied with a, a glass and then it's fused to the panel. So they're very long lasting. 
They won't fade over time. Uh, and they're very, very durable, uh, even to most forms of uh, vandalism. And then the, the arrows and the numbers are vinyl, so we can change those out as we need to for the life of the sign. So they'll be reflective, uh, so those will really pop at night. The reason for the two sizes is, as we were walking it, and if you imagine yourself on the trail, there's parts like as you go through Chelsea, where you're off road and there's not a lot of distractions. And in that case, you don't want a huge sign on the trail. You want to be out in nature. And so we tested these smaller size signs, which do the job perfectly well walking or on a bike. So we want to keep that, that size down when, when needed. In other cases, when you're at an intersection and there's cars and there's just street, you know, V dot street signs everywhere, there's no way your eye is going to go to something this size. And we needed to scale it up because we're competing with really ugly, <laughs> so like bright fluorescent street signs. And so we, um, we tested out a bunch of different sizes. We went out, we held it up, we, we biked, we walked to make sure everything was legible. And so that's why we use the large signs in some cases and the small ones in other cases. So you'll see the, uh, with that 1.5 north there, that will be indicating you're one and a half miles north of that mile marker zero. So we have some of these, uh, on those blaze signs, uh, mile markers kind of scattered through the trail just to give it a sense of where you are located on the trail. And those will be keyed to the city's 911 system. So if there are incidents on the trail, uh, people would be able to call in and say, I'm you know, at this mile marker and the police will know exactly where that is. So this is a photo of the actual signs and they're gorgeous. They were fabricated by the same company that did the signs for the High Line in New York City. So they're really, they're the nicest signs we've ever had in this area. They're going to be, they're gorgeous. Very happy with the manufacturing. And we've done a series of these instructional signs that just give direction to cyclists. Uh, so it's a definitely a changeable message. So we can add things you know, as we talk through and get great feedback. So if we need one for telling people how they should alert others that they're about to pass them. We can, you know, take one of our, you know, some of our spare ones, add some uh, messaging to it and put them up on the trail. Um, and then the one on the left is a pretty specific one. I believe there's another slide later on where we kind of show where we're splitting paths. We've identified several locations where it wasn't really appropriate or there have been issues in the past where people are going through on a bike or they're running really fast and they just kind of want to blow through an area but they're pedestrian heavy or very narrow sidewalks. And so we found ways to split those. So there's a pretty much equally lovely path for somebody if they want to go through on a bike, but they're not going to have as much chance of running pedestrians over uh, or crashing through a wedding. I crashed, I went between the couple getting married and the priest or, or minister marrying them and rode my bike right in between them as they were getting married. So not good. That happened in the pagoda. So no. Yeah. yeah, we had some first can reasons of why we might need to make some separations in the different types of traffic. So we'll take, take your feedback and make some new custom instructional signs. And then there are some places where uh, there are certainly different types of paths or the different areas coming together on the trail, or it's a little unclear where you might need to go. And then sometimes we use these blade signs also to indicate sort of a long, longer distance uh, goals. So some of them will say things like downtown and then the other direction would be naval base. Just to give an indication of, you know, when you jump on the trail, what are you going towards to help people orient themselves kind of at a city scale? Um, and we'd use these also yeah. for those divisions where we're breaking up cyclists or pedestrians. These are the same size as the ones that the Downtown Norfolk Council put out along the waterfront downtown. So if you've seen those, um, then you know what this looks like. Section signs. So these are the section signs uh, that will indicate as you move from section to section, you know, some of the, the top attractions that might be within that section that's coming up and, you know, the section name give you a, a map of it to so you sort of get a general lay of the land um, and just sort of set, give some identity to the trail, allow people to recognize areas and, uh, sort of help them understand their progression as they're moving through the, the trail in the different areas. This is the only sign that has sponsorship, or these in our large trailheads. Um, we did want to make sure we didn't commercialize the trail. 
So um, when we certainly sponsor support it, but we wanted to be uh, very careful about how logos were displayed. So on this, um, we have Look, we have donors that have given us up to half a million dollars each and we wanted to give them an opportunity, but we wanted to make sure that ERT was first and foremost and that this was very simple and tasteful. Okay, so this is how, how we mapped it and kind of what that the behind the scenes looks like. Uh, and so we've, we, we did, uh, I think it was 12 different sessions of walking the trail. Uh, so we would walk about a mile, mile and a half, one way, mapping every sign that we thought was needed. So you're talking about the, those intersections or places where the trail changes. And you know, anytime we felt like we needed some reassurance or direction, we added a sign. Uh, so you'll see those indicated here on the map. Uh, and so it's it's a lot of signs that were added. I think there were only about 100, 120 on the trail before uh, for mm -hmm. its entire length. And now there will be 500 plus to tell people where to go and how to get there. We wanted to be sensitive to sign clutter and pole clutter and we're pretty proud that we're we're really only putting about a dozen new poles in. Um, so we're really working with our existing telephone poles, light poles, etc. so that we're not you know adding a bunch of obstructions and we're really working with what we have. So we'll have these nice new clean signs on sometimes kind of messy poles but that that is the backdrop of um, of the trail. So we, we thought that was the right move to make. Um, um, this is an update right now. We're super thankful and grateful that we've had this many um, folks and companies and groups kind of buy into this vision and decide that spending private money to invest in a public amenity for other people is a really cool thing to do. So um, we just hit our $4 million capital campaign and we had a bunch of individual donors and um, so we'll have a celebration on um, a new public art piece at the Pagoda when we can all get together in public again. Um, and this is where it's going to be. And this is one of those areas where we've got our, our slow path or our walk path and then we take our biking or fast path in a different direction and uh, our donor sculpture is going right there. And this is that slow fast route. Uh, actually worked on this, uh, I don't know if you know Dane Gomez of Social Cycling. So we, we brought him out to help us figure this path out and uh, we had four or five of us walking mm -hmm. this. We walked pretty much every street through Freemason, uh, multiple ways, multiple directions. We mapped this a bunch of times to try and find a route that Kind of met the needs of everybody who we thought would be using the trail regularly. Uh, there's still some details to be worked out with uh, how York Street works since it is a one-way street. Um, we've kind of brought up some of the ideas uh, with the Department of Transit and are even looking at getting uh, a pedestrian or a, more of like a trail signal like you see especially on the WNOD where they have like a, a trail user cycle on the light. Uh, we would love to get that over at that intersection of Duke and Butte Street because uh, it's kind of a, a weird traffic pattern mm -hmm. right there. But this way gives uh, cyclists and people who are running fast a great route to go right up Duke Street. Um, it's not super heavily traveled by vehicles. It's nice and straight. It's fast and smooth for the you know cyclists uh, and then kind of take them up York Street and then connect back up with the trail there right at Botetot and Brambleton. Um, we've, Liz and her team at Timmins have really been working with ODU um, to create a trailhead at Whitehurst Beach. Uh, we do plan to put in another kayak launch there. Um, that's the details of that are still being figured out. Um, but we love the fact that we can, um, we have our loop that's going to take us through campus and then our trail that's going to shift um, west and start to stick close to the Elizabeth River and show off this great amenity, which is watching the um, folks go out in their boats and there's tons of parking and there's a fitness challenge course and the ODU students have a place right here where they bring all of their kayaks um, up the street and so it'll be a nice new amenity. 
Um, this is a recent change. So if you're interested in routing, uh, this is the proposal, which is that we come, you know, across the bridge at 25th Street, we sneak through Lambert's Point and the micro farm, and that the trail itself will stay right along Powhatan and then um, take a turn to the right at Longhorn, which is going to take you right to the, you'll be looking straight at the football stadium. The loop um, will turn, um, this okay. is up 43rd, and then just as it does, cut straight through the heart of campus. So you see the web center, you see the fountains and the lions and the lawn. And so it really starts to show off the university. We do the same thing over at Nordic State with our plans for expansion to really um, show off the campus. We've been working on rerouting for detours. And, and if you've been through Fort Norfolk, you've seen Harbor's Edge is under construction. Uh, Cheryl works closely with um, the right of way folks at the city to try and put up temporary signs to provide the best route possible when we have all of these trail closures due to construction. So um, that's our current detour. Yeah, I know there was a question that came in before about, oh, about the, uh, the signage through here. Uh -huh. uh, so it's been kind of thrown off by uh, the detours and the changing routes and then the uh, we're planning to have new signage in before trail opening day this year, but kind of COVID threw a wrench in that plan. But uh, this area will get sorted out and it will reflect what you're seeing here as the routes through Fort Norfolk. So it's, it's, we're gonna take a turn up 2nd Street. We're gonna stay on Front Street. So you have that view to the water. Um, the trail currently just goes right up uh, Collie Avenue. Um, our, long, our longer term plan is actually to come behind Harbor's Edge and they've, they've actually adjusted their building to overhang the trail and sneak this way and get off road so we're not competing with people pulling in and out of Harbor's Edge. Um, we've also had a lot of talks about Town Point Park and it's gonna be interesting to see what happens post COVID um, when people may not wanna be in huge groups, but What's been happening for several years is that when a festival um, is happening, the, the ERT gets shut down and then Waterside Drive gets shut down and, they're, and folks have to start to snake through downtown. And so uh, master planning's goal is to, um, really is to have that never shut down because the best trails don't shut down um, for festivals and let this be a constant. Uh, but right now, um, we are trying to be team players with everyone and we recognize that there are some events that just it's too hard to control wine fest and beer fest and harbor fest and so we've asked that fest events kind of limits the time that they close the trail and this is the detour route we've worked out for just a couple times a year so we're we're pushing more and more to let this really be a community resource and not just a festival park and to let the trail stay there and stay operational uh, the cool thing about all of this is it's not just about the ERT, but we're connecting to um, the Southampton Roads Regional Trail. We're connecting to Virginia Beach and Portsmouth and Chesapeake and Suffolk. Um, and this regional trail connects to other trails and uh, we can go on and on till we get from Maine down to Florida and we connect up all of our systems of trails. So, um, Cheryl um, and Dita attend regional trail meetings and they're working to make sure we kind of get noticed on a, a national level so that we can be promoted and all of these trail systems can link up together. Um, so I want to hear more about your questions and, and wanted to address, let's start with talking about that, do we want to line down the center of the trail? Um, uh, as well as the trail width. So, Right now, the trail width that, um, that has been approved by my planning is 14 feet wide. Uh, we, in many cases, we don't have that, but that's our ideal is 14 feet wide. When we're out in the open and there's no fence and there's no building, 14 feet wide right now feels pretty darn good. When you're in a place like behind the bird sanctuary where you've got chain link fences up, I think we're, are we 12 feet wide, 10 or 12 feet wide at that point? all of a sudden it feels like it's only eight feet wide because you're hemmed in. And so um, 
we need that breathing room. And when we don't have that breathing room, the trail needs to be a little bit wider. Um, we feel like there's a lot of places where the trail would benefit from that line down the middle of it. And we always want to have a line down the middle of it when we're going around a curve. There's nothing that helps people, bikers especially, kind of stay on track and not run into someone is when we go around a curve. But it's, it's really up for debate whether our grand vision is to always have a line down the off-road section of the trail. We have a lot of parts that go through the neighborhood. And in that case, we don't have the luxury of adding paving markings. So I think our the lens that we look at everything through is how do we design the best, most clear version of the trail for this particular environment or section? So, so hop on in. Now, do you want to um, stop sharing? Stop sharing screen. We can mm -hmm. take a look. Thanks so much. That was a really, really great overview of years of work and thought. Um, really appreciate that. Um, I, um, I, we, you definitely covered a few of the, the questions we had early on, but I would love to know if there's anybody else on the call that has any other questions about navigating uh, certain sections of the trail. I know you guys are Google Earth experts and can pull up things if we need to, to take a look at them. Yeah, I just have a comment about the, um, the um, going past Town Point Park when there's a festival in there. Waterside also closes the trail to have their movie night. Um, and we can't get around that. And of course, there's the in-water boat show that closes everything down. And we need some kind of markers around there or something. Yeah, we, um, we, we identified about nine different stakeholders down at, at Waterside, you know, including the ferry and the marina and um, had meetings with everyone and developed a couple of different routes for different events and have provided temporary signs that look like our new signs that are coming for them to use. And it is the responsibility of the person that has city approval to, to detour the trail to install those signs. I think everybody could do a little bit better job about that um, during it. And, and again, our long-term goal uh, to really keep people, uh, to keep the trail open as much as possible. It's, it's definitely very difficult to envision the trail open during Harbor Fest when there's so many boats right there with, with the trail, um, people getting on and off. But um, we just got to keep working towards that effort and being a little bit more adamant about um, those temporary signs and making sure we communicate when detours are coming up in advance so people can plan their routes. Well, I also want to say this looks fabulous. I can't wait for everything to get installed. It looks great. Can I say something? Gonna... Okay. Yeah, jump in. Um, I think the signs are great. I just would hope that when they're installed, that the installer realizes the importance for cycling, that they're uh, the same consistent height. Because when you're right, it's one thing when you're walking, you're coming up to the intersection slower, and you'll see the sign no matter where it is, right on the right side, left side. But it's important that the sign is hopefully at an intersection is uh, usually on the right hand side or the left hand side, so it's consistency that way and at the same height level. But on cycling, a lot of times we're looking at the ground too, and those, they don't have to be large, you know, like the big ones that they have now around ODU, but if they could have um, even two feet by say three feet on the pavement at the intersection, you would definitely not get lost. But I don't want to overlap all the signs on the ground because then we get over signage. But if we could have this, the height and the installer, I, I know you mentioned you're not gonna be putting in many new poles, but mm -hmm. there, uh, can we use some of the poles below the stop signs? Or uh, I think that was yeah. an issue at one time we came to you on a city sign that, um, but we need to have a sign that is the same height um, so we know where to see it. That is one of the things that was in our signs specifications for the installer was specifying a consistent height for the signs to be located when they're installed. And, and also if it's on the right hand side of the trail or the left hand as you're coming up. Those, we've, we've placed each one individually 
as best we could to keep them as consistent as we could. Uh, we're working around a lot of different things. So there are some places where they'll, they'll shift around a little bit, but for the most part, we've, we've kept them fairly consistent. Just you tell you, there's, there's some unique conditions that made us have to flip to the other side in some cases. So it won't be a hundred percent consistent, but we did the best we could with existing conditions. Um, I've talked to Cheryl about it on the 25th, 26th street. You mentioned the trail going down 25th street. That's going to be a lot of construction in the next year or so with um, the project being started there at uh, rail yard. That, uh, mm -hmm. should, we, that should we go down 26th street is more residential right now and then switch it um, back to 25th street. So you go through the rail yard. Right. And the, the official path of the trail is 26th street. And so yeah. the new signage will indicate continuing up uh, Hampton to 26th, going down and then coming back to the bridge. Uh, we, we can look at, you know, after, especially after rail yard, gets constructed, we can look at maybe rerouting it and see what, what the conditions are at that point. It'd be uh, great to go through the rail yard. I think that'd be great to have <laughs> people experience that. Yeah, it was, um, we actually, so the, these are both our architectural projects. So we're, we're working with IP Configure. This project is almost, almost finished and they, they offered up their land for the trail. And then we're also designing the rail yard with these folks. And they also offered that the trail could go right through here through the main courtyard. Um, I, there was some discomfort on master planning with competing. If this is full and concerts and drinking and all of that stuff, people were worried about sending bikers straight through here. Mm -hmm. um, and then we would also have to pay, some of our capital improvements budget would have to help this out. They were willing to give us the land, but they weren't, like these folks, this is a smaller business, they didn't have the budget to build that section of trail for us. And our long-term vision is actually to go across the tracks. <laughs> so we want to go, um, we yeah. want to start to firm up and go over and come back. And so we wanted to kind of not spend a lot of money doing something that is going to cost a lot but we still have the barrier of it's really unpleasant to go under um, the bridge here and it's a barrier for families we hear from a lot of people who live yeah. on this side of the tracks that say they ride the trail they stop they turn around and we hear the same thing from families on this side and so ultimately we need to find a safer way to cross um, and get people on the other side well good you know i think going down 26th street would work fine yeah, so that's where we're that's where it'll be signed for now. And then we're we're working with a firm that's doing renderings to cross over here. And um, we'll see. It's gonna be a tough it's probably nearly an impossible ask for Norfolk Southern, but we're gonna try. Um the other the loop through around Old Dominion is excellent because Powhatan, you keep it's, it's a busy street, not going down Bowling or Magnolia. I live in Larchmont. And going, I think it's Bluestone they're going to go down and around by the stadium. Yeah, yeah right. Longwood to Right here. To right here, that's right? A, yeah, you go right by Quarantine, I think, Street and all. That's kind of Yeah. That's kind of great. Quarantine's the best. That's our favorite. <laughs> yeah. That's a good loop. That's a good way to do it. I like that loop you all came yeah. up with. That's, that's a good solution. Yeah, a lot of variations there. That was that was a fun one to work out. Yeah, we walked that one five different times. So basically, people come to us with an issue that feels like it's something we need to solve, and then we have a whole group of people that we get together and brainstorm and try and figure it out. And um, we're all volunteers, and we're just trying to do our best to get it figured out and and make some really big improvements in the city. Just let us know as you keep walking and riding. Um, if there's something that needs our attention, just let Cheryl know and know that we've got a team of people um, signed up to, to get to it as, as quickly as we can. Um, so we're, we're a little bit over an hour. So um, just to be respectful of you, you and Peter's time. Uh, if there's any last minute questions, we'll take them now. And um, anybody? 
Okay. Well, I just want to um, thank you again, Mel and Peter. Um, your work is, is just amazing. You give so much time and energy to the trail. We are so grateful to have you guys involved. Um, for everybody else on the call, um, please follow us on social media, um, uh, ERT Norfolk. We're on all the platforms. Sign up for our newsletter. Um, you can do that all at elizabethrivertrail.org. And we are also a nonprofit. So if you can or you want to share the great work that we are doing to make this trail accessible and keeping our waterfront accessible for people, um, please do so and encourage people to donate and help support our mission. Uh, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate um, having you guys here. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.